Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this training this morning. We're gonna be talking about normalcy and the reasonable and prudent parent standard. My name is Beth Chaplin, and I am the Title IV-E Administration Consultant for the state of Minnesota. My name is Kim Lemke, I'm the Adolescent Services Consultant. Deborah Besky brown Child Foster Care. And Amy Walkner, Child Foster Care. Just a little bit on housekeeping. So as you may have heard this morning, we'd like you guys to keep, um, keep yourselves muted. We will have um, at least one time throughout, maybe a couple more, where we will be breaking and allowing questions. So if you could just keep track of your questions um, until that point and keep yourselves on mute, it would be greatly appreciated. Also, if you would like to send us your questions um, and your live streaming, you'd like to send them to us electronically, you can email those questions. Um, you should be able to see on the PowerPoint the email address, but it's to deborah.besky.brown at state.mn.us. There you go. And those questions will come to us and we will answer them as well um, when we come to the point where we are taking some questions. We also ask that you folks that are here with us in St. Paul, if you could also table your questions until we take those breaks, be greatly appreciated. And if you are viewing the archived training, um, we're gonna be videotaping this training and sending it out on DVD. Then you can send your questions to um, one of the three of us and our emails are also in the PowerPoint, I believe at the end. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about the law that is requiring the institution of the prudent parent standard and what has prompted our discussion about normalcy and that, um, that standard this morning. The Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act, Public Law 113-183, was signed into law on September 29th of 2014. It amended a variety of Title IV-E requirements for all states. And those requirements in, that needed to be amended included case planning, um, provisions for runaway youth, provisions for children that are under another planned permanent living arrangement, which we also refer to as APLA, as well as provision for, provisions for sex trafficked and exploited children and youth, and made some changes also to the rights of youth in care. There is a bulletin that's currently published. It is Bulletin 156817. That bulletin is in the process of being altered slightly. Um, the revised version or corrected version, which is the C version you see on the PowerPoint, um, that's going to be published within the next probably two weeks. In the meantime, a lot of these provisions are in the current bulletin. But if you'd like to wait for the most updated version, again, that would be published um, within the next two weeks. So we also wanted to talk to you a little bit about why the training is required. We're gonna try not to just read off of all of this cumbersome um, statutory language, but in essence, um, the state is required to establish standards for family foster homes as well as child caring institutions. That includes our corporate foster homes. Um, and those standards must include the use of the prudent parent standard. Uh, the second point that we'd like you to be aware of is that the standard must be applied not only in family foster homes, but also in child caring institutions. And the way that they are applied in child caring institutions, and we'll discuss this um, a little bit more at length um, later in the presentation, is that child care institutions must have at least one staff member that works on site that is trained and is designated as the caregiver to apply the standard. So on to page six, um, a continuation of why the training is required. And this I actually do want to read. This is important, it's particularly to us and to all of our county and tribal partners. We as a state must certify that foster parents and designated staff are trained with the appropriate knowledge and skills to provide for the needs of foster children. And those knowledge and skill sets include the application of the reasonable and prudent parent standard for the participation of the child in age or developmentally appropriate activities. And we're gonna get a little bit more into depth um, later on in the presentation about what that entails. 
And then also there should be training on the knowledge and skills relating to the application of the standard to decisions such as whether to allow the child to engage in extracurricular enrichment, cultural and social activities for things such as sports and field trips. Um, also including overnight activities that last from one or more day and the decisions about signing permission slips and arranging for transportation to and from extracurricular enrichment and social activities. So the folks that must be trained on these points include child welfare case managers of foster care placements, county agencies, child welfare staff, and tribal agencies with Title IV agreements, child foster care licensing staff, licensed child foster parents, and designated staff at corporate child foster care homes and residential facilities that are approved for Title IV-E. <clears throat> and so now we're gonna talk a little bit about normalcy and Kim is going to present this information to you. Okay, so normalcy. Why is supporting age-appropriate activities important? Um, basically, normalcy refers to allowing children in placement to experience childhood and adolescence in ways similar to their peers who are not in care. And to achieve healthy development, children and youth in foster care need to be involved in normal and developmentally appropriate extracurricular and social experiences and provided opportunities for safe risk taking. So basically, anything that your own children would do, our foster children should be able to do. And again, why is this important? They need to experience the same things. They need to make those social and emotional bonds. Cultural connections are very important. Um, skill building. Again, we want to make sure that they're already in a traumatic experience, we need to, to help um, mitigate that experience by helping them to feel normal. Again, they should be having all the opportunities to practice these skills, build relationships, and contribute to a successful transition to adulthood. What are developmentally appropriate activities? So with that, you need to be looking at the child's cognitive skills, where are they at emotionally, physically, behaviorally, and taking all that into account and what's typical for an age or age group. So removing barriers to normalcy, <clears throat> county and tribal agencies, child placing agencies should all support the foster child's emotional and developmental growth by permitting child to participate in activities. I want to be very clear that we are permitting them. We should not be um, not having them participate in these activities. The tribal agency case managers should be including these activities in the out-of-home placement plan and independent living plan if they are 14 years of age or older. And this provides the opportunity to discuss with the parent these interests making sure to consider the cultural um, activities and anything that's available to them in the school, community, foster home. And this allows for the parents' wishes to be considered. That does not mean that um, what the parents want is what's going to happen, but they need to have a say in, in what happens with their child. And now I will turn it over to Deb to talk about reasonable and prudent parenting standards. Okay, so you've heard about the federal law and how the federal law has changed to allow um, foster parents and designated, um, and designated staff at our residential facilities to apply the, the standard to make decisions about what, uh, what kids can do that is typical normal activities that children in their community and in their culture participate in. So now I'm going to actually talk about the standard itself and what the standard is, um, and how the standard is applied. So going to the PowerPoint. So the reasonable and prudent parenting standard in Minnesota law is now found in 260C 212 subdivision 14. 
Um, there was some additions that were provided to that law in this legislative session. So you will see some changes to that when um, the uh, legislative update is done. You will see that that information is also included. So um, there will be more information than what is currently in the standard. And we're talking about, and as I'm talking about this, I'm talking about the information that's currently there as well as the information that will be there. So if you go back to your computer this afternoon and look up 260C212 subdivision 14, and you check me to make sure what I said is there, you're not going to find it all right now. <laughs> so I just want to be aware, be aware that some of that is in, will be part of the update. But what the standard actually is, and this first bullet is there, is characterized by careful and sensible parenting that maintains the health and safety, the cultural, religious, and tribal values, and are in the best interest of the child. While, while the um, person who's acting as a parent, meaning the foster parent or the designated person at that facility, is encouraging that child's emotional and developmental growth. So, down the bottom is just those people that I talked about, and they use this standard to determine whether a foster child may participate in extracurricular, enrichment, cultural, or social activities. So this is permissive to allow them to do that. When they are doing that, when the foster parent or the designated AS staff is applying that standard, making decisions that are, are safe and healthy for the child while considering the child's best interest, these are the factors that they must consider. And these factors have been added into law. These factors came from a discussion. Many of you have heard about the um, uh, child foster care work group that met this past year where we had um, representation um, from agencies and families to talk about some foster care. Uh, the work group actually determined these factors or added to these factors or reviewed these factors. So this was part of the work group. I'm going to talk about each one of these factors individually and how a foster parent or designated staff um, will consider those. And I'm going to use a piece of language right now. Instead of always saying foster parent and designated staff because it's lengthy, I'm going to say the caregiver. So when I say the caregiver, you know who I'm meaning. They are the people at the residential facility, the people at the corporate foster care site, or the foster parent, relative and non-relative. <coughs> So I'm going to use some examples now of how the foster family would consider each one of those standards. So the first example I'm going to talk about is a child's age, maturity, and developmental level. Um, and there's two examples here for consideration. One is a 10-year-old foster child who's invited to attend a social event. One of her classmates is having a uh, birthday party, and she's invited her to participate in the birthday party. The foster child has some developmental and social delays. So how as I, as a caregiver, help her prepare for this new social activity? She's not automatically saying the child can't because the child has some developmental delays or that there may be some concerns. She's considering how can I help this happen and for the child to be successful in doing what other 10-year-old boys and girls do. The next one is a little different. The next one has an example of a 14-year-old who wants to go to a movie. And um, it's really typical for 14-year-olds to want to see PG movies. That's many of the movies they want to see. But how do we consider the content of that movie? And if the child is able to handle that, especially considering the trauma that the child has gone through or the events of their life and what emo what behavioral issues or strong emotional response may come from that. And to, so and sometimes, as many parents do, look up more information about what that content of that movie is and have that consideration before, before saying yes to that, with knowing that it's very typical for our kids to uh, want to go to that type of movie. So the next one is risk of activity. That's the second factor to consider. What is the risk of this activity and how do I consider it? So the example here is allowing our foster youth to ride in a car with a friend. It's very typical for teenagers. I, as a parent of a teenager, had to come to grips with this one myself. It's very typical as a teenager to say, I want to drive with so-and-so and go here. Um, so what is the risk of that activity to allow the foster child to, to ride with a friend? Is it 
a good step first to say, yeah, you can go with him. He'll drive you to school, which is close by, which may, um, which may not have as many risks as driving to the Mall of America, for example, or the timing of the event to allow him to ride to an evening concert. The school is having an evening concert, and it's still driving to school, but is there more risk involved with going in the evening than there is during the day? So figuring out um, those, those, what's the risk of this activity? What do I know about the friend who's driving? That kind of thing. Those are things parents do all the time. Another common consideration regarding risk, and I'll just go to this for a second. It's not on the slide. Another common um, way that parents um, consider risk is they consider risk by considering what safety elements are available to reduce the risk, such as what safety equipment is required for an activity. Do they have that safety equipment? Can I get that safety equipment for the child? And then um, will he wear that safety equipment? Um, we take risks every day when we get in the car and we drive someplace, but we use our safety equipment. We make sure our car has, everyone has their seat belts, and we have cars that have um, um, airbags. Airbags, thank you, the word I was looking for. <laughs> um, so we make sure that we're doing things to reduce what might be a risky activity. So again, using the equipment or what's required for that activity to make it okay or to reduce the risk. So best interest of the child. This one is, is that consideration of what is in this individual child's best interest. We tend to use this word a lot in child welfare. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what best interest meant when you're considering activity. And I've got two examples here. There's probably tons of examples. Um, but was camp selected because it fits into the child's interests? Or was this camp and it's something that the child wants to do? Or did it work at a time when the foster parent wanted a break? So that was the camp that was selected based on the availability of when the foster parent wanted a break. There's nothing wrong with either one of those, but just to know how we consider best interest is to consider what the child wants to do, what their interests are, and how this activity fits into that. The, so here's another one that becomes an issue oftentimes for our older children. While while the youth is going to school, that might not be their, their primary interest. They don't see school as preparing them for what they want to do. In my example, I've used um, that he really wants to be a chef, and he wants to go to culinary school after graduation. But his grades aren't very good in school, but yet he wants to take a part-time job at a local restaurant as a chef. Is it in his best interest to take that job? and to um, work on what he likes to do, knowing that if he works many evenings or during a Saturday, that that will um, impact his grades or get in the way of him doing his homework, getting his job done. So that is just that consideration, what is in the child's best interest. The next one is some of what Kim was talking about, the importance of experiences in the child's emotional and developmental growth. Will being on the soccer team help the child build self-esteem and develop social skills she needs? Will it help her develop friendships in the school? Will it help her develop further interests? Or um, will it also help her um, learn that she can accomplish things? Um, it's a very big deal when kids um, are on an activity and doing something and they actually accomplish a skill or a task in a way that they didn't before. It helps the self-esteem building. So this is a part of importance of the experience in the child's emotional and developmental growth. The next one is the importance of a family life experience. And this slide actually asks our caregivers to think about things that they may be allowing birth or adopted children to do, especially our foster parents, that they cannot let a foster child do. And why can't they let that foster child do it? And it challenges us in child welfare to think about some agency policies or practices. It may not be something written, maybe something unwritten, that we have put in place that really prevents a child from experiencing a typical or normal childhood activity. So the importance of that family-like life experience, is there something that they're not able to do that the other kids in the household do, and is the only thing preventing that an agency policy or practice? The behavioral history of the child. 
Now, when we think about the behavioral history of the child, I, um, I probably in these examples should have used something that where we're looking for how the child can do this versus how the child can't do this. But given the child's history of impulsive behaviors, how can I allow him, if, he wants, if you want him to be part of the uh, family projects in the lawn, how can I make that a prudent parenting decision and allow him to be part of the projects in the lawn? Maybe the lawnmower isn't the thing to do, but maybe he can handle the clippers or maybe he can do other things that, that would be part of that project or that job. Um, or in the other case, this is more about supervision, given the child's history of underage drinking, or other things that may have gotten him in trouble with, with being away from su adult supervision, can I allow him to stay out late at night unsupervised? Is that a prudent decision? So applying the prudent decision making to consider what the child's behavioral history is and looking for ways of making that successful and allowing him to have social events that may not include staying out late. So the final uh, factor is the wishes of the parents or guardians as appropriate. Um, I'm stressing that as part of case planning, and on the out-of-home placement plan as well as the independent living plan, there are places to talk about um, the child's interests, their goals, what they want to do uh, when they grow up. And um, how we're using those activities, uh, the, those uh, plans, to talk with the child, with the caregivers, and include the parents in that conversation about what they want to be involved in and how can we help them be involved in this. Um, and to make note of those on the case plan with a sentence or two about that discussion. If a parent does have a particular concern um, about a child doing a particular activity, what is the concern? Trying to break down what the particular concerns are about that and trying to get information or consultation about the activity and what steps can we take to address the concern so the child could participate in something they want to. Um, the last piece is to talk about as appropriate. And I just wanted to define what appropriate is. And it wouldn't be appropriate if the parent's not involved in case planning. If a parent is not involved in case planning, then the wishes of the parent or guardian um, would not, be, would not be part of your discussions with them. But that would be where we want to make sure that the parent and guardian is informed about what the child wants to do and what their wishes are, and then to uh, take the necessary steps uh, as you need to to address those concerns. All right. So now I'm going to hand it over to, um, if I can. We're going to do questions after you, after you okay. do the next part. And then we'll do questions. Yeah. So that was a little conversation you weren't supposed to hear, but mm -hmm. I'm looking for the right. So, so now Kim is going to talk about um, the guidance uh, about the childhood activities. OK, so I'm assuming that everyone has the handout, um, it's the two-page handout about Minnesota's reasonable and prudent parenting standard guidance. And the first page of the handout is basically our, our VPC, our PowerPoint here that we're talking about today. So I'm not going to go over that. But on the back side, there's a list of different activities um, that could be considered. And this is not an all-inclusive list by any means but just something to give you ideas on, on different activities and, and things to consider with our youth. Um, and the one thing I wanted to point out to make sure everyone is aware that if the youth is 14 or older um, and is eligible for self-funding, self-funds can be used to um, pay for activity fees or different things um, that require money for these youth to participate in these activities. So, so keep in mind self-funds. Um, funding should not be why a youth cannot do specific activities. Um, but some of, some of the options um, to think about are family and recreation. So whether it's outdoor activities, thinking about summertime, we're getting into that season of camping, boating, um, swimming, Recreational vehicles, um, having them go out to movies, video game, playing with friends, 
again, the lawn equipment. Um, even though, you know, we're talking about activities, it doesn't always have to be the fun things that kids want to do. Um, they can also participate in family activities and being part of the household as far as taking care of the house, taking care of the yard, that type of thing, um, having chores. Um, the next list is school and extracurricular activities. So again, thinking about the field trips that they do for school, um, sports, um, drama, you know, other, other activities that they do from at school. Um, overnights and planned outings. A lot of times we don't think about our foster youth going on overnights and we should be thinking about them going on overnights just like um, other children do. So sleepovers with friends and you don't have to do a background check on every place that they go. Social media and activities. Um, again, Facebook, Instagram, you know, all the, all the things that our youth are into these days, as long as they're not misusing something, I mean, <laughs> again, you can use, think, withhold, um, you know, if they're misusing it, of course, then that's a, a different discussion, but they should be able to, to be involved in those activities. Driving, that's a big one for our, our teenagers. They should be able to get their permit to practice driving, do behind the wheel, and eventually get their, their driver's license. Um, again, there, there might be things that impact that, um, but we should always be moving forward and trying to get them to a place where they're able to have those things in place when they do leave foster care so that they are successfully transitioning to adulthood. Babysitting, that's one that we don't usually think about with foster care, but it may be appropriate that some of our foster youth are able to babysit. Um, again, looking at their age and, and developmental um, capabilities to make sure that that's appropriate for them. Again, transitioning to adulthood, um, going on college tours, and making sure their independent living plan is made with them and for them, um, and that you're following that independent living plan. And there are things that, even though the caregiver is able to give permission in most instances, there are some that they need to get permission from the agency to do. Um, anytime you take a, a youth out of state, extremely high risk activities, or anything that's gonna take the child out of the foster home for more than three nights, you should be talking to your agency about that. And the other thing I wanted to say as well is, you should always be talking with your agency. Um, just because you don't have to get specific permission um, for the youth to do something, the social worker, the agency should always be aware of what's going on with the child. Again, that's part of the independent living plan um, for our older youth, but always keeping them informed of what's going on. Um. Okay, so again, county and tribal agencies may develop written policies permitting these activities. Now this is something you don't have to, but if there's something specific to your region or area that is very popular, counties or agencies might want to make specific policies surrounding that um, activity. Again, this is meant to be permissive, not to take things away from youth. And, and you don't have to make any specific policy if there's either not something to make policy about or you just wanna go by what the state has um, come up with. And, and what the state has come up with is what you do need to follow. Um, let's see. And the agency policy must be provided to all foster parents and designated staff who accept placement of your child. So just making sure everyone is aware, if you do have special policies, that they know what's going on. Questions? So if you have questions in Greater Minnesota, just unmute your mic and let us know uh, what your question is. Um, and St. Paul, if you'll just wait a couple minutes and let um, see if there's any questions from any of the sites before we move here. Question for my Sandy. Sandy, go ahead. I know that the statement was made that funding should not be an issue, but the reality is, is that it is. 
and when we have the cell phones to help, that's great. But it's the middle school age that gets kind of caught in between. Elementary doesn't have that expensive of things, but still, it can be expensive if we want to have kids feel a part of their school, a part of their community. Can you talk a little bit about what what DHS is thinking about that to help cover that cost? I guess I would look at look at the MAPSI, see if there's things there that the child, um, you know, could increase their their cost for foster care. Um, the other piece is we have the Forgotten Children's Fund, which is up to $300 for a child who's in foster care to participate in those special activities. And I know some agencies do have different donation accounts and things like that to fund special activities. I, I would also add that your school and communities also do fundraisers for most activities. So oftentimes there is scholarships or um, scholarships or um, they might call them um, reduced rates that are reduced fees that are available. So a lot of times, if and the foster parents are probably most likely going to be the ones who will have to research this, but to call the organization and ask them about that to make sure that they know uh, what funding is available. Because most, most communities and school have very active booster or fundraising activity, events along with those activities. Did that help? I have a question. Oh, so we've gone now. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I have a question in Meeker County. Um, I have a 17-year-old that's asking to um, be able to be allowed to drive with a friend, and he's telling me that the friend has a license. What do other people do in terms of saying whether or not that kind of thing is okay or, um, you know, I'm not going to do a background check on his friend, <laughs> but how, how do you work through that or what are the things that we need to think about with that? So to clarify, is the friend is the licensed driver? Yeah, he is. Okay. And he wants to drive where? Um, I think they just kind of want to cruise around town. So, so again, this would go along with what, what's typical in your community and, um, and how you're using those factors for the, um, and, and actually the prudent parenting standard is suggesting that the foster families can make those decisions about individual activities and what they're planning on doing, when they're planning on being home, um, as I said in the example, talking about where they're planning on going, what, what is the risk to that event, um, and what they're planning on doing when they plan to be home. And is this, is, um, is there some discussion with a friend about it? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing something in St. Paul. So John, do you want to ask a question? I think the mic might pick you up, but we'll try to paraphrase after you talk. Um, the question I have, so you mentioned some of these uh, possible risky behaviors, maybe there's an outstate um, placement, working on uh, outdoor things, chainsaws, using four wheelers, things like that, um, which are normal family behaviors out and, and activities. Um, does this law kind of, like we're always this liability kind of worry about worst thing that possibly can happen so let's try to avoid that and obviously I don't want to be morbid and but bad things happen things happen so is this a partial understanding of the statutes and laws that unfortunate bad things happen if these decisions are made based on good judgment or, or whatever's in the community or, or that experience with that foster parent that some of that is I mean, it's still going to be an issue, but is that addressed, I guess, through this? So that was long. Yeah, that was long. It was a good question, though, John, and I think it's an important question. So John's question was, um, some families have very, um, uh, they do recreational activities that are very, it can be risky at times. 
um, they are um, maybe riding snowmobiles as families, or they're maybe doing certain things. And we haven't always let our foster kids do that because of the concern of liability or risk. We'll talk about liability in a moment, and we probably should have talked about that before this. Um, I will have you turn to the handout um, that actually addresses that. And it says that um, on the front page of it, it says caregivers demonstrating compliance with the reasonable and prudent parenting standards are not liable in a civil action if a child is harmed or injured because of participating in the approved extracurricular activity, cultural or social activities. So I want to say there is a liability component to the law that also, ha also has been added to the Minnesota law. But I will also add that I think your concern is, is one of the pieces that we want to make sure is addressed in the case planning aspect of it, that we're reviewing with the family at that time of placement about recreational activities, about things that are happening, so that um, the child is able to participate in that family as a full member of that family, um, and that they're not um, sent to respite or put in a different place because they can't do something a family does. However, if there are some really legitimate concerns a parent has or that um, other people have, how can we figure out those concerns and address them? So, John, your question isn't a yes, no, always kind of answer. It really requires what, um, what social workers do best is assess, have communication, have conversation and coordination um, regarding those things with the eye on giving a child a normal experience when at all possible. With the, with the plan of being permissive, right? I mean, manage risk, but being permissive. And let them be kids. Yeah. Let them be kids. And that's different and different. That's why we also talked about, that's why Kim talked about the um, having um, for your agency to kind of consider, is there some policies we want to be clear about? Um, when we looked at um, policies across the state, um, there were certain Western um, communities who clearly included rodeo in part of their um, thing. So there is there's certain cultural con considerations that we need to be really careful about and consider them. So if your agency knows of those that aren't addressed in the state um, policy that you want to continue to do, please do. Um, our counties and tribes are the ones that should be developing those policies and then sharing that with any licensed foster parent or facility that you are placing with. It would be the county with the uh, legal responsibility for the child who would be developing those policies. Other questions? In silence speaking volumes, I'll move on. Oh, we do have two questions for no. streaming folks. No, yep. Two questions. The first is um, clarification. Do So caregivers do not need to get permission from the social worker for a child to go on an overnight. With applying the reasonable and prudent parenting standard and having that conversation during case planning, um, they can apply that standard and make those, make those parenting decisions. The second question is in regards to driver's licenses and car insurance. It's very expensive for car insurance. And for example, it's sometimes difficult to get a foster child on a policy. Has there been any discussion surrounding this barrier? There have been lots of discussions surrounding this barrier. Um, what I can tell you right now is, again, cell funds can be used to help cover car insurance. Um, we are looking into working with the Department of Commerce on different car insurance issues. Um, that being said, all teenagers are very expensive, not just foster youth. Um, and so, again, that can be something that um, is looked at as far as um, foster care payment. I don't know if there's anything in the MAPC that would there is, cover. There is. Um, you know, at least help with some of that cost. Obviously, it's probably not going to be dollar for dollar, but nope. again, you, using self funds as appropriate um, can help with that cost as well. Oh, 
Okay, so the next part of our presentation is how this will impact case management practices. And again, empowering our um, foster children 14 and older in developing their own plan and successfully transitioning okay. to adulthood. Sorry. So we're going to have a technical difficulty right now because I pushed the wrong button. Um, so we're not going to have the PowerPoint up at this very moment in time. We'll get that fixed as soon as we can. Um, but I think we can go on. Most people have the PowerPoint in front of them, I believe. Sounds good. So how will this change case planning, court reviews, and case management practices? Um, as part of the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act, and this was actually put into our state legislation last year, um, foster children 14 and older may designate one member on their case planning team to apply the reasonable and prudent parenting standard. Um, so this could be, you know, one of their two members that they have asked to be on their case planning team. This could be the foster parent, you know, whoever they want to designate to be that person. Um, as well as part of case planning, consider the child's interest what children of this age do and activities available in the area, and engaging parents in these discussions and decisions. So again, as, as our social workers already do, make sure your, your case planning, including everyone in case planning and getting everyone's input on decisions. Annual court reviews. So for children who have the designation of permanent custody to the agency, need to assure that reasonable and prudent parenting standards are followed. So this should be addressed in court. And the youth should be consulted in the court hearing about their opportunities to participate in such activities. And this is the statute where it um, talks about the out-of-home placement plan, the independent living plan, and that we have included the regular opportunities to engage in age appropriate or developmentally appropriate activities. So this is a goal right on the independent living plan that should be filled out and should be taken into consideration for that youth. And just to restate again that self funds can be used to support this participation um, and funding if needed. Okay, and I'm going to talk about what does this mean for foster parents, corporate foster care, and residential staff. Um, it, probably most importantly, I would say, um, agencies need to ensure that prospective and current foster parents and the designated staff in corporate foster care and residential facilities must be trained. Um, and then in addition to the training, the agency must be available to address questions, particularly for foster parents and for the facilities um, designated staff people. Um, they're going to need advice, particularly in the beginning stages of allowing them to go ahead and exercise the prudent parent standard. The training should include very specific competencies to support a child and the child's development and normalcy and should include the knowledge and skills related to the developmental stages of a child's cognitive, emotional, physical, and behavioral capacities, applying the standard to decisions. For example, some of the things that we've talked about today, field trips, overnight activities, the signing of permission slips, et cetera. Consideration of their roles and responsibilities to regulate and the application of the reasonable and prudent parent standard. The consideration of the child's opportunity to engage in the variety of activities that we've discussed and more that are unique to the child's cultural and or tribal customs. After this initial training, prospective foster parents and designated staff must be able to apply the prudent parent standard by developing and improving their decision-making skills and supporting the safety and well-being of the child while participating in the activities. Consult with the county tribal licensor or case manager when direction or guidance is needed. And to help with older youth as they work on developing decision-making skills and exploring safety, time management, and complex emotional issues that may arise. 
for residential facilities and corporate foster homes, just a reminder, there needs to be at least one staff person that works on site that is trained in this normalcy and prudent parent standard and the application of it. And that, or those, I should say, staff members are authorized to act in the role of the parent in applying the reasonable and prudent parent standard in a way that is similar to how a family foster home parent would apply the standard. And the caregivers need to communicate with the responsible county and tribal and licensing agency about guidance on normalcy and the application of the reasonable and prudent parent standard. And as we discussed, any written agency policy if applicable. And this gets to the, one of the questions that was asked, um, right? It's being added to Minnesota statute that caregivers that demonstrate compliance with the prudent parent standard will not incur civil liability if a foster child is harmed or injured participating in any approved activity. So I will go on with the um, misconceptions and reality. Um, so we thought we would address some of the um, specific um, maybe not always misconceptions um, if agencies had policies related to this, but that would be misconceptions now with the prudent parenting standard and what the reality is of it. So let's go to the first one. So one of the misconceptions, and we already had a question on this, for a child to stay overnight at a friend's house, the adults living in the friend's house must undergo a background study or check. The reality is that the friend's parents are not short-term substitute caregivers. They're not license holders or designated respite providers. Normalcy and the prudent parenting standard provides foster parents with the guidance to make this parenting decision. Misconception. Foster children are not allowed to attend community functions without an adult. Um, this is a longer answer. <laughs> um, responsible social service agencies and licensed child placing agencies need to support the child's development and emotional growth by permitting children to participate in activities or events that are generally acceptable for, student, for children of the same age and developmentally appropriate. The question that we had earlier about um, do I let a 17 year old drive around town with his friend? I think that's a great question. I don't know the answer to it, but I do want to know what other 17 year olds are doing in that town. Is that something they do? What's the safety factors related to that? Is that something that um, would be considered a generally acceptable in that community? In some communities it would be, in some communities it absolutely would not be. Foster parents and designated residential staff are permitted to allow foster children to permit, to, to participate in extracurricular activities, social and cultural activities that are typical by the child's age and by applying the reasonable prudent parenting standards. Um, if you've taken nothing from this, for, uh, if you've taken two things from this, one, foster families can make these decisions, but we really recommend that in case management, in, in case planning, that these conversations are regularly had with the foster parent. And I doesn't say this on the slide, but I would also recommend in the face-to-face. -face. Now, workers are talking with our youth about what they want to do, how they're being supported to do those things, what's in the way of them um, participating in activities they want to do at school. And if they don't want to do anything, um, how can we help them think about what they want to do? How can we help them um, develop something they want to do? Um, so those conversations with case managers, with our caregivers, um, and with our, our youth and kids are really, really important. And it doesn't just start at the youth. It starts when they're much younger with our kids, fives and six and sevens and eights getting involved in things. Misconception. Birth parents' wishes must always be followed if they disagree with an activity involving their child. Again, a little bit of a longer answer. Legal parents' involvement with foster children is critical. 
and a family's wishes must be considered. Normalcy cannot override case plans or other court ordered requirements. To support it, I just said this, to support normalcy, it's encouraged that these conversations occur and that it always be part of case management. The other piece that this talks about as well is how to include the parents with the visitation schedule in some of these activities. Um, that we are open with the idea that if the child is participating in activity, that the parent also be able to see that child participate in the activity like other parents get to do. So if the child is on the soccer field, that the parent know when the games are that the parent can or grandparents or whoever else is involved with the child. So that visitation, um, it, it can be really difficult with visitation if you've got a child who's active in things and you've got a parent who has a limited capacity of visiting the child considering work hours, transportation, but how can we include parents in those normal activities that their child is normally doing? Um, and to, um, so here's some examples I, besides watching the game. Um, having the child bring their trumpet or bring their musical instrument to the to um, visitation and have them play. They can get their practice in and play for their parent. Um, help the child getting supplies for club posters or other things that they have to do for um, a group or, or um, activity that they're involved in. Um, just like the other parents do to make sure that that is a normalcy on both sides. Not just a normalcy for the child but also a normalcy for the parent. So what is Minnesota doing to support um, age and developmentally appropriate activities? Um, we've um, provided the ongoing, the um, written guidance um, that we gave, um, the new best practices guidance that we just um, has as a handout. We are certainly willing to provide ongoing guidance and technical assistance regarding this. Um, this is the training that we're providing for case managers, foster care, and caregivers. I, um, fully anticipate that in the next year or so, we'll be talking about how this will be included in the child welfare training system. Um, the other part is we're administering self funds to support the cost of youth activities. And the middle one, which I will talk about now, is how we're gonna gather and retain data on who's trained um, to apply the prudent parenting standard. One of the things best said in the beginning is that we have to certify that foster parents and designated staff at residential and corporate homes are certified, are trained. We have to certify that. So we need to gather information about who's attended this training, um, and we need to um, have it reported to us about who's attended this training. In early June, a DVD of this training will be mailed to county tribes with Title IV agreements, private foster care agencies, corporate foster care sites, and residential facilities approved for Title IV-E. As part, as part of that mailer, we'll include instructions about how we are going to document um, the certification of those folks. And the deadline for that documentation to us will be September 28th. So um, early this summer, you'll be getting a packet from us with that information and how we want that documented that um, all the licensed foster parents um, and uh, for the site uh, for the residential sites um, how the staff has been designated and trained and we'll have that sent back to us um, in a way that we will be um, reviewing to make sure everyone is trained um, so here is um, more information about um, how um, we are going to report who's attended this training because you can see that who attended this training is significantly important. The top is how county and tribal social service staff are routinely, um, we routinely keep track of how uh, folks do that through our child welfare training system, and that has not changed. Just remember at all the sites to take down who's attended the training and to either scan that and email it to Myrna or to fax it to Myrna at that number. Um, for the um, live or the archive st uh, streaming, you need to confirm your attendance to Myrna by email. Um, and so then the bottom is talking about the letter that, uh, that um, private foster care agencies, designated staff at corporate and foster care facilities, and foster parents, that designated letter that you are going to receive and to look for that to explain how we're going to certify that everyone has attended the training. 
And finally, this is just some resources. If you want more information on the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act, there's a link that you can read the entire uh, federal law right there. There's also information out on the Child Welfare Information Gateway about normalcy and its resources for foster parents and applying the prudent parenting standard in normalcy. And then promoting normalcy for children and youth in foster care. And again, those websites are there for you to check out for more information. Um, Kim, which one has the um, Casey, the Annie Casey um, uh, guidance or um, the middle one? The middle one. Um, definitely, if you want more information, the, um, the um, guide from Annie Casey. What is it called again? I can't remember either, sorry. that to, it, It's from Annie Casey, it's very good. I looked at it um, uh, in preparation of this and it provides a lot of good information and I would recommend checking out that middle. Yes, um, the middle link, there's gonna be about maybe 10 or so different um, articles and PDFs that you can click on to get more information. Yep. And finally, so Betsy Rockymore would like to add something to the training. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I know um, counties and tribes will have concerns about how they can get all their staff and all their uh, foster care providers trained by that date. And so what we encourage you to do is, as a part of your regular training for new foster parents or ongoing training for current foster parents, that you can actually take this DVD from this training, which um, will be sent out to your counties and tribes, and you can gather all your... Uh, Providers together and, and have them do the training. We will also send enough DVDs to your county or tribe so that you can actually give them to your foster parents and then have them give them back to you or encourage them. Either way, we have to have it documented that they actually uh, were trained and that you're going to give send us um, whatever um, sign-in sheets or documentation that they were trained because we really have to try to get the whole state trained. Thanks. Sorry. Any final questions? <clears throat> any of the sites have any questions? Well, if you think of something later, feel free to email any of us questions and we'll get back to you. So one of the questions is um, from um, a person uh, streaming it, is will DHS be developing a training for foster parents on this normalcy and prudent parenting standard? Um, and is this the training that, certi that certifies providers? Yes. So the training we're doing right now is the training you can use this, we will be taping this DPC, and you can use this this um, uh, DVD that we'll be sending you uh, to uh, show to your foster parents and the staff uh, and the designated staff. And if they complete this, they will they will have completed the training. I believe in the future you will see a different type of training be provided, but this will be the training that we'll be looking for you to certify um, and get back to us by the end of September. And eventually, we plan to get this, tra this training on YouTube. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I have. So I've had several questions. Um, Maxie is reminding me that we've had several questions about getting something on YouTube, or getting this um, on YouTube. Um, we will be working on making it more available that way. Um, I don't know uh, when that will happen, um, but we will be working on that, and we will get back to you and let folks know as soon as it is. Um, we've got a couple more questions here um, from people who are streaming. Can a 16-year-old buy a vehicle if they are in foster care with a relative? The relative is in the process of transferring legal custody to them, but it's not finalized yet. Well, I don't know that a 16-year-old can actually be on a title. I thought it was 17 Thanks, so um, before they can actually be on the title. But at age 17, or when they can be on the title, um, they certainly can buy a car. If they are working and have a way to um, purchase that and keep up with the maintenance, I mean, again, if 
if you have your own 17 year old, are they buying their own car? Are they, you know, taking care of those things? Um, so it, it's definitely something that can happen. Again, it's each individual youth, you got to look at if that's appropriate for them. So then there's another question here about a foster home that's a hobby farm. And part of the hobby farm is their family rides horses. Um, I would suggest that you have um, consultation with the licensing agency in the home about how to do case management regarding that and to make sure that you're including those kinds of conversations in, as part of case management um, and to um, be discussing what's available at the, at the family. It's not just, um, it's many things our families do that they do regularly. And then we also, there's also a question about slide 10. Okay, that's actually talking about self-eligibility. Yes. Um, part of the federal statute where it talks about the age-appropriate activities, that that is specifically under self for those who are likely to age out of foster care. So that does not change our self-eligibility, but if you're going to use self-funding for youth, you should be um, looking at your youth who are likely to age out of care. Now, what does that mean to your agency? You have to decide if that youth is likely to age out of care. That doesn't mean that they have to have a permanent custody to the agency permanency determination, but if you really think at that moment they're going to age out of care, then go ahead and look at paying for the age-appropriate activities through self-funding. And then the final question is, um, do both foster parents and the foster home need to attend the training? So in your family foster homes, if only one parent makes all the prudent parenting decisions about the child, they, um, they are the ones that decide if the child, if it's only the, I'll use the example, if it's only the father who decides who in the family is going to make decisions about um, activities and that kind of thing, then only that parent needs to be trained. But if both parents make decisions about, um, can you go outside today? Um, can you um, ride your bike today? Then, um, then only one pa then both parents need to be trained. It would be pretty unusual in a foster family to have only one parent making that level of decision. So Terrell's got a question. So um, if we were to give DVDs to the foster providers to take home, will we need them to do like a test, a post-test or something like that to show that they've actually watched the DVD? So Terrell's question is, is there any type of post-test to show they've watched the DVD um, or anything to, and at this point we have not de defined anything like that. So it would really be the licensing worker asking a couple of questions when they turn it in. Did you complete the training? Did you understand it? Making sure that they, if there's any question. That's at this point what we have available. Maxie wants to add something to that? Yeah, and, 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 uh, <laughs> and, and, and really the whole point of all of this is that you should be having a conversation with your providers, right? With the foster care providers. I mean, because that's what this really is about is that you should be having a conversation with them explaining prudent parenting to them, having them see the training, and then having them ask you questions. So I think, yeah, you'll know that. But are we going to require a written um, post it as after it? No. However, you would want to make sure that somehow, and we're, we want flexibility in having them be able to tell you that, yes, I did complete the training. And then sign off. Thanks. I would just remind folks that slide 32 talks about the skills talks about the uh, components that the foster parent should show and that this training did include some examples of applying the prudent parenting standard for that purpose. One more question come in. What part of liability will DHS take on when a foster child does a high risk behavior and gets hurt? Just okay. So at this point, um, and I guess um, foster families, are, the state of Minnesota already provides liability insurance for foster parents. Um, and to uh, take a look at that information, that's something the state of Minnesota has provided for many, many, many years. Other questions?
with that, I think we'll um, wrap it up. Thank you. If you have additional questions, be sure um, to um, email either the um, either one of us presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.